Welcome back to another episode of A Legal Studies Teacher Reads the News. Looking at a crime example today. And what I usually do if I'm looking through a crime one is I'm not 100% comfortable using people's names and identities. This one, I mean, it's all on the public record. So, for example, if you go to Sydney Morning Herald, here's the article with all the names, etc. put there. But what I usually do is, is chuck it into a document here and, and redact the names just of the, the offenders and the victims uh, because I don't want my channel perpetuating these stories, etc. But as I said, it's on public record. So if I'm accidentally shown it at some stage, uh, you know, you, if you're interested, you can go and see the name there. This is by Georgina Mitchell. And I'm going to read through it and then we're going to look at how it's relevant to the crime case and how you could use it. So a woman's been awarded $115,000 after a New South Wales police officer pointed a gun at her chest handcuffed her and pepper sprayed her dog after she failed to stop her car in Sydney Southwest. Uh, the victim or the offender in this case was driving near Picton in 2013 when a highway police officer, a uh, patrol officer tried to pull her over because her car's registration had expired. She kept driving for about three kilometers prompting a low speed police pursuit till she arrived at her home and pulled into the garage. There they are. This is the police footage of the incident. Some dash cam there. There's the, the footage, uh, senior constable, what is his name, in, can be seen running into the garage after her car with his gun drawn and held to his side. About 19 seconds later, he's seen backing out of the garage with his gun pointing towards Miss whoever's chest. He can also be seen spraying capsicum spray at her dog when he pushes the animal to the side to grab her and it snarls at him. He bit me. He's lucky I don't shoot him. The constable said in the video, I'm sorry, I don't know where you train, but Australian police don't behave like this. The lady said. So she's handcuffed, taken to the police station where she's held for six hours before she's released on bail. Uh, the plaintiff sued New South Wales Police in 2016 for false imprisonment, battery and assault. She was represented by Shine Lawyers. An initial ruling in the New South Wales District Court last year dismissed her claim, accepting the evidence of Constable that he brandished his gun because he mistook the keys in her hand for a knife. Now, this is where it's a little helpful here. See here, we've got a little uh, link in a judgment on Tuesday. If you click on that link, it shows you. And remember, you don't just have to take the Sydney Morning Herald. You don't have to take Georgina's uh, kind of word for what's happened. All of these judgments are available. It's it's where we... Okay, so here's the judgment. It's all there. There's Mr. Baston's judgment talking about the appellant was this and this and this. Okay, so it's all there. If you go to case law, you can look up any case unless it's involving uh, you know, a minor, et cetera, et cetera, or if there's a case where, where information is redacted, all this information is on public record because we have a transparent justice system. So basically, the judgments are in the Court of Appeal, so they have appealed, and the judgment set aside the district court's decision, so it said that was wrong, and it awarded her $115,000 and ordered the police to pay her court costs on top of that. So that'd be a, you know, multiple thousand as well. In her account, she said she was collecting her shopping from the passenger seat when the driver's door opened. This is in her garage. She said she felt something pressed against the back of her neck, heard a male voice say, I will shoot you, and was dragged from the car by her hair. The constable said he pointed his gun at her because he thought he saw an eight to ten centimeter knife in her hand. He argued the arrest was necessary to prevent the fabrication of evidence and to stop her from offending further. In his judgment on Tuesday, Justice Anthony Marr found her arrest was unlawful because the evidence does not show reasonable grounds for any suspicion that would make her arrest necessary. Remember, what she's done is drive to, driven without registration. And basically, they've arrested her uh, not for that, but for, for basically, you know, the police pursuit, etc., etc., and claims later that she had a, a, a knife. So we'll see that. Uh, Justice Ma said, at least part of the constable's evidence of what unfolded during the 19 seconds of the garage cannot be correct because it is simply not possible to fit into 19 seconds all of the conversation which the constable said took place. Okay, so here's this kind of... Uh, Here's an example of the court system using what we'd call circumstantial evidence. The, the judges basically said, 
you have said this was said, then that, then this, and then that, and then et cetera, et cetera. And that is actually not possible within the 19 seconds. So you set up, what we call it a timeline, where, where you actually work out, you know, is, is your account actually able to fit into the timeline? And the video evidence from the car dash cam has said it was only 19 seconds, and that's the first strike against the constable. Next, the constable also did not mention the critical detail about the knife in any contemporaneous document. In other words, the police have to fill in, and this is why, ladies and gentlemen, this is why the police need to fill in paperwork. Police do a whole bunch of paperwork. For every incident that's occurred, they have to write, this is what happened, this is what occurred, this is what the person was wearing, etc., etc., etc. This is what I said, this is what they said, because precisely for this incident, he actually has said in the court case that he thought she was going to be killed during the... So, sorry, he's noted that she thought she was going to be killed during the garage incident, but he didn't. He did not mention the critical detail that he thought there was a knife. In other words, she sued him three years later, or whenever it was, it was eventually heard three years later, she sued him and he didn't write down at any point and then I thought she held a knife. It was only when it was a belated claim. So Justice Baston, well, oh, sorry, said the circumstances did not warrant the pointing of the gun at her unless the belated claim about the knife was accepted. In other words, he said, you can't tell me that in your notes that you took at the time, you forgot to write down oh, yeah, I thought she was holding a knife. And if that's the case, if that critical detail wasn't important enough at the time, why should I accept that you now say you thought her keys were a knife? Okay, as a teacher, there's no way I'd accept that from a kid. If, if he wrote what happened, you know, on, in an incident down, and then when the principal comes up and talks to him, he says, oh, yeah, and this also happened, wouldn't you look back at the notes and say, oh, hang on, you didn't say anything in, in, in here? That's why we get them to write down their notes. So Justice Arthur Emmett said the conduct of Miss, whatever her name was, in failing to pull over is inexplicable. In other words, there's no reason why she shouldn't have pulled over straight away because there can be no doubt she was aware the police car was behind her. Nevertheless, note that, nevertheless, at the end of the pursuit, all the officer needed to do to ensure the driver of the vehicle was dealt with according to law was to ascertain the identity of the driver. In other words, all he had to do was say, can you please tell me who you are so that we can send you a fine for not driving without registration? I don't need to pull my gun on you, a lethal weapon, and point it at you. That's basically what the, the officer is saying here. So, so looking at the syllabus, what's going on here? This shows us a whole bunch of things. For example, if we're looking at themes and challenges, Issues of compliance and non-compliance. So if we're thinking through legislation, what's 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 going on here? LEPRA. Hopefully you guys all know what LEPRA is. Law Enforcement, Police and Responsibilities Act. That sets out what police are allowed to and not allowed to do when it comes to this. And so within this would be a whole bunch of stuff about when they're allowed to pull their gun. And if they do pull their gun, for these reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see all this stuff, okay? Dangerous article means this, 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 this. Dangerous implement could be this, you know, a knife. So all of this sets out clearly and police need to, and they're supposed to when they're trained, and I'm sure they do, go through all of this, okay? This is what a school means. This is what a senior police officer means. So it's all just setting out what the words in this document refer to, and then it's got a whole bunch of information. Okay. Division 2 powers to require identity of drivers and passengers to be disclosed. Power of police officers to require disclosure of driver or passenger identity, etc., etc. Okay, so it's, it's setting out a police officer who suspects on reasonable grounds that a vehicle is being or was or may have been used in connection with an indictable offence may do any or one of the more following. So it literally says, if they think this is happening, these are the three things that they're allowed to do. All right? Failure, if the person fails to do it, here's what's going to happen. If a, if a passenger doesn't disclose identity, this is what happens, etc. Okay, so the, here's all the powers set out, and, and the court is saying this officer did not follow it, and that's why this woman has been awarded $115,000. So we're looking at 
issues of compliance and non-compliance, the extent to which law reflects moral and ethical standards. So in this case, we're, we're clearly saying uh, even if somebody doesn't respond to sirens and doesn't pull over, that does not mean that they can have a gun pulled on them. That, that kind of would be a reflection of moral and ethical standards. That, that, that's clearly what the justice is saying here. The end of the dispute, all he had to do was ensure the driver was dealt with according to the law, was to ascertain the, the identity of the driver. So, so thinking through here, we're looking at, we would be thinking through criminal investigation process. So police powers, this itself is, is the crime being reported on. And how is it actually being reported on by Georgina? I think very well, well done, Georgina. And then stuff like uh, arrest and charge. So what's happened here? What have they arrested her for? What have they charged her for? They've clearly done the wrong thing here. And then you even got the role of uh, the courts. So uh, where would it be? Well, it's kind of not, because she's not charged with a criminal thing. I guess that that's technically not the courts, is it? Uh, but it's helpful to see the court process, the idea that she lost and appealed and actually won the appeal based on the fact that the Court of Appeal found the original judgment did not take into account the, the constable, you know, just believe the constable when he said, oh, yeah, I thought she had a knife. And so this, the, the Court of Appeal actually went through and said, no, a couple of things didn't happen here. Note the contemporaneous documents didn't have anything. And also the circumstances didn't warrant the pointing of a knife. Okay, so that's lepra. And that's sitting through all the circumstantial evidence and going, no, your 19 seconds is not long enough for what your version of events was. Also, you didn't write down the note. Uh, didn't write down in any contemporaneous notes that she had a knife. You thought she had a knife at all, and the actual circumstances in Lepra do not warrant that you were, you know, you were able to point the gun at her, unless this claim that was made only later in court, not written down, is believed. And frankly, Justice Basson did not accept that story. Okay, so that's helpful. It shows us a whole bunch of. Um, Things. First of all, if we're thinking through crime and you're asked a question, so for you know the role of discretion in the criminal justice system, we can talk about this idea that police officers need to ensure that they're following uh, the law and that they can't take the law into their own hands. You could talk about that. Probably more likely it's an issue of compliance and non-compliance in regards to police powers and the police using those powers. Uh, the extent to which the law reflects moral and ethical standards. So you could talk about the idea that uh, that police have certain powers, but uh, citizens expect them to ensure that they are following that at all times. And the extent to which the law balances the rights of victims, offenders in society. Uh, actually, and the effectiveness of legal and non-legal measures as well. So, so here you've got the law clearly did not act in a balanced way. Uh, this woman's life was in danger for driving an unregistered vehicle, really. If, if he's got his, if he's pointing a lethal weapon at her, then... And, you know, her dog has been capsicum sprayed as well. Uh, you'd want to be able to bring up this question of, well, how well did, did the law balance her rights in this situation? And what was the effectiveness of the legal measure in achieving justice? Well, she's received compensation because a judge has finally decided after an appeal, yes, her version of accounts of, of what occurred are more believable than his. Okay, so hopefully that's a helpful example of what, where we could use a, a case here. Uh, you can look up the case if you want very briefly. It is in Sydney Morning Herald, September 15, 2020. And you'll see it there. Woman awarded 515K. All right, thanks for listening.